Yeah, so welcome to this um, atelier on uh, trauma tapping technique. Um, we are here from the Peaceful Heart Network and based in Sweden, but working internationally since um, 2007. Um, sharing and spreading techniques for regulating the uh, stress and trauma. Um, and we are super happy to be invited by Co-Create Humanity. Very honored to, 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 to have the possibility to, to share our work for, um, about how to, to manage your own mental health also when dealing with difficult situations and challenges in the world. Um, so yep. my name is Gunilla Hamne and this is my colleague Ulf. And when you've listened to this, you will be able to regulate your arousal in your nervous system. You will be able to work on creating daily resilience. And you will actually be able to lessen, and in some cases even resolve, symptoms of what is sometimes called post-traumatic stress. But we don't use diagnosis. So it's not about if you're diagnosed or not. It's just that the symptoms can be the same up to a certain stress level, whether you reach that level or not. And all of these things can be met and resolved, sometimes completely, sometimes lessened with these methods. Yeah, so our work started um, in uh, the part of the world, in the central part of Africa, in, in Rwanda, actually. So that's where most of our experiences come from, eastern part of, of Africa, for different reasons. Um, I have a background as a journalist and a body um, therapist, um, but as a journalist, I realized that I was asking questions that can um, re-traumatize people that you, you meet who have been through difficult things. Looked for something that was possible to share with others and to use in those situations, because um, talking about challenging things can be very important but when you leave somebody with an open wound um, I didn't feel uh, comfortable in that and one of the things that uh, or the one things that I found that could be used is this technique called tapping um, what we are going to share this evening is um, trauma tapping technique but there are many other versions of this and, and I was working as a one-on-one -on -one therapist and coach uh, with people of all kinds using other techniques like hypnosis, neurolinguistic programming, clean language. And I found that I needed something that would address on a more nonverbal level, something that was possible to do to regulate arousal without necessarily having to do therapy or coaching with spoken word. And I found a blog with a woman traveling around in Africa, working, helping people with um, post-traumatic stress working over cultural barriers and without actually the approach is more of a first aid approach do something right now that works and makes a difference and that was Gunilla. and so together we have um taken this this specific kind of tapping there are other kinds of tapping uh but what we've done is we've adapted this to work specifically with trauma which means anybody can use it it's a first aid method we teach it to children we teach it to people with all kinds of varying educational levels it's completely non-dangerous because it doesn't try to do therapy it's first aid mm. yeah so together we founded the peaceful heart network and our organization is um a network really a network uh, and our aim is um you know, say our what do you call this our words uh, of um, uh, for our vision is to to um, um, ease suffering to prevent violence, because as you know, when people suffer, I mean, um, you become very easily reactive, and to avoid this and to make it possible for people to to live have more space between what you know what is called the stimuli or when somebody saying something and what is your reaction to it. Because the more stressed you are, the closer the stimuli and your reaction will be, meaning that um, you're not really um, deciding over your life because you become reactive. And this can come from living through stressful situations, like being a humanitarian aid worker, uh, where you are constantly, because you have gone to a place that is uh, has a lot of challenges, which means that there is a high stress level and you will be affected by it. And um, sometimes this will be um, what is called secondary trauma, meaning that you see things 
that affects you. But it can also be that you actually come into a situation that is very dangerous uh, and have your first hand experience of, of um, something that for you feels inescapable, meaning that it will give you a traumatic reaction. So these techniques that we decided then when we created this uh, network is techniques that anybody can learn. So we know many other things, just like Ulf um, referred to hypnosis and other things that are based on cognition and, uh, and, and spoken words um, and also long trainings. But these techniques that we have uh, specialized in for our organization and that we share are techniques that anybody can learn. It doesn't matter the level of education, age or culture or background or anything. Anybody can learn it because and 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 they go direct into your nervous system. And to give you an idea uh, what kind of situations that this has been used in, uh, we, like we said, we started out in Rwanda. We ventured on into Congo. We've been doing this together with Katrina's Healthcare in the Moira Moria um, refugee camp in Lesbos, Greece, and we used it for the humanitarian aid workers because it's it's very common with humanitarian or um, volunteer burnout, as as they call it over there. Uh, people are staying awake 24/7 because they want to be there when the next boat hits the um, hits the beach, and they want to be there and help the babies, of course, that are maybe in hypothermia, so they will jump out and probably in some cases so eager to help the baby that they take the baby from the mother and they run with it to a doctor somewhere and the mother is traumatized because the baby is gone once she reaches shore there are so many things when we don't think uh we've been do this is dr shiana maruf shafi that uh that we showed the methods to uh and she was heading to the katunio's healthcare unit there and she said it helped her and this is the thing you have to realize that you need to take care of yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, there is this huge risk that something will go wrong because you actually need, I mean, everybody takes care of hand hygiene. We know we need to wash our hands. So um, everybody does that, nobody questions it. We take care of our teeth, hopefully, which means nobody questions brushing them. But do we take care of the stress or do we bring it back to our families? Do we bring it back to our colleagues? Do we bring stress from, from other places to the next client or patient we see? And that's emotional hygiene. And this is where we are. We would like for these methods, if, if we can be utopian here, to be as common as washing hands and brushing teeth and that it's on the schedule of every single human being should know how to regulate emotionally and lower their arousal because it's that important. Stress is at the root of every single disease we have. And if somebody said, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk said, um, if you take away trauma from the DSM-5 diagnostics manual, you will have a pamphlet. So regulating stress is vital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is what we saw. I mean, so since we referred to that this work started in, in Rwanda and then being uh, um, uh, coming to Eastern Congo and uh, Uganda and, and also Kenya and some places and South Sudan and places where challenging situations have been. And I could say then meeting so many people and being in a way, I mean, of course, ourselves, humanitarian uh, workers, but also meeting others, working for other organizations in these areas. And for me specifically, the first experience were in the eastern part of Congo. And as you probably would know, that there are um, has been a conflict going for so long time and, and, and still is. I mean, it's considered that five million people are um, displaced within the country and at least one million outside the country. And then working in this environment is is very challenging. And as we are referring to the refugee camp in Moria, which is now, of course, history, because this was in 2015, 16, 17, 18, and then before uh, a pandemic. And since then, we have not been there. And today, that is a completely different story in, in, in that island and in Greece in general. But in other parts, it is constantly you you meet this these situations. And now we have been we also work with psychologists in, in Ukraine. Um, 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 dealing with the situation there. And then, of course, like now, we are looking for 
connections also with those working in Palestine and, and Israel. And this is how we've been, been doing since we started our work. It is that we look for the for places and then those who are already reaching out to others to assist with stress and trauma and adding on these tools because what we will um, show you is or uh, and the techniques that we are working with is something that can be added into your daily hygiene the, your daily emotional hygiene or into the activity if you are working direct with beneficiaries or i mean in a humanitarian situation and then you can teach it to them but always coming back to that you need to work with yourself first um because the more and you can regulate your own stress the more you will be able to share this with others and the more you start noticing your own reactions your own um level of stress the more you will be able to to do something about it and more you will be able to notice when the stress level goes up so that you can avoid burnout so you avoid to getting into the situation where things just tip over which is very common because you are in a situation you have chosen perhaps to be i mean you have chosen to be a humanitarian aid worker that means that you have taken on a job that is very challenging and then for some you can feel that yeah i should manage this situation because this is why i chose this work it is to be on the edge or you know in this very um, difficult situation, like working with, I mean, one of our colleagues in Congo, he works with the MSF, with the Médecins Sans Frontières in, in, in the Congo. Uh, and he, you know, he has learned this, that, you know, I have to work on this myself first, and then I can assist others. It's like on the airplane, you take the oxygen mask yourself first so that you can give it to your kids. Otherwise, you faint. And also, uh, what, what we're saying here is that a lot of people, uh, we believe, I mean, we've been working in up to over 45 countries uh, spreading these techniques. Uh, and we've, we estimate we've reached maybe around 300,000 people. It's hard to know exactly. Uh, and we have loads of testimonies, loads of free materials. You will be getting the materials. So if you're looking at this video later, just go to our website. There's a free app in 34 languages. There's a free book. There's free instruction manuals. All this is free. That's what we do. We spread this. But we want you to be one of the people who finds help for yourself and then passes it on. So this is what one volunteer paramedic said in Greece. Yeah, and this out of my desperation arose what I'm sure will be a turning point in my entire life when I was reintroduced to the trauma tapping technique, which is this technique that is our hero technique, thanks to the founder of a charity I was working with when I got attacked. And this is just this that, I mean, we're taking this 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 quote because this person coming as a paramedic to the, to the refugee camp, when things happen there, uh, I don't know, I mean, some of you perhaps have followed, I mean, what... In, in Greece, there became this huge resistance to all volunteers and all uh, refugees coming so that the local population started, you know, attacking the, 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 the volunteers. Um, and, and this person was in one of those attacks. And what happened then was triggering all the things that he had been through before. And that is what can happen, you know. You perhaps have chosen to become a humanitarian aid worker because you had challenging situations yourself when you grew up uh, or in school or in any way, or you have seen, or in some way, you know about these things, but you have not resolved them before you started this work that you're doing. And like, and, and that was the case of, of, of this, this friend that we worked with in, 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 in Greece. And he came back to, to, to UK where he comes from and, uh, he could not continue his work. I mean, he used, used to be an ambulance, um, how do you call this, a, a first responder in ambulance, but he lost his job because he could not cope with this, but he didn't really understand what was happening. He just felt depressed. He started isolating himself. He had all these symptoms and that anybody from the outside could see that this person is, is traumatized, but he didn't understand that, but he understood something. And then he... Um, um, called the person who was the, the director of this organization that he came with to, to Greece. And she referred to, to these techniques. I mean, to actually, she sent him a, a book that we have written about these techniques. 
and and he had already been introduced to this trauma tapping in the in the camp but then he kind of said that oh i, I don't know i don't trust these kind of um simple techniques you know there is like whoosh whoosh or whatever you call it in english i mean it's woo -woo. something woo woo <laughs> this is this is woo woo but then he started when he realized himself i have to do something kind of desperate actually and then he he started using um this tapping technique and was able to resolve things. And then he saw that, wow, this is really uh, something that can be you know, shared. So he, he, he wanted to, to share this with others also. So we hope we convinced you that you know, it's, worth, it's worth the minutes it takes to experience. And it's nothing you can read about and get convinced. It's nothing that there's over 155 peer-reviewed studies about it. So don't worry about the science. It's not about that. If you want to understand it, Hearing about it is not enough. You need to do it. You need to try it. So we will have you give you a chance to experience it. But just to give you a really short uh, background on it, our focus has been on trauma, stress and trauma, but mainly trauma. And trauma is, it's not a disease. You're not broken. It is a defense system. It, we don't say post-traumatic stress disorder. We say post-traumatic stress defense. So it's something that is there to help you avoid a situation that you couldn't handle earlier in life and it will warn you in every possible way but there's also the fact that as a humanitarian aid worker you are on a daily level experiencing stress and we all know this this is not rocket science if we get too much stress this the bucket that we have that can handle stress our bucket of resilience will overflow and we crash so we need to open the tap in different ways to reset it and resetting it can be done in sane and good ways, being social with other people, exercise, sleep, hydration with water, good food, not bad. Uh, those are sane and normal ways of resetting it. Other ways that are a little bit more detrimental uh, are, for example, alcohol, but very common with humanitarian aid workers and also with church workers. It, it's, it's just there because it happens. So what you need to do is to understand that this is an addition to that. But the main thing here is, out of all the different ways that you can relax the nervous system and empty your bucket, this is one of the few methods that you can do for yourself, but you can also do it for somebody else. And that's the difference. So you can do this for yourself, but you can also do it for somebody else. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, so um, we can... Um show you this technique we will just you know introduce it as uh, as um something that you can just follow um afterwards i in the in the text below uh, at youtube there will be the links to our website and where you can find videos uh, that you can just follow because we have done so much instruction materials because that has been our i mean one of our priorities during these years that we have worked it is to do easy accessible information material and everything of our materials from our book to videos to our website to trainings everything is for free so you can join also one of our other webinars that we have regularly at the end of each month um, on Wednesday evenings actually in the late last week of the month but the materials you can um, just go to to that website and you will find videos that you can follow but now for this, we will just uh, show you the, the, the trauma tapping technique, the TTT, some just call it TTT, um, because that's uh, short and like so many techniques will be three letter abbreviation, they call it TLA, three letter abbreviation, and TTT is one of them, and there are so many others, um, but this one is um, easy to follow, so... Just just before we do it, uh, just to, to put it on the map for you. So there's talk therapy. We, there's loads of great talk therapy. There's there's CBT. There's ACT. There is motivated interview uh, interviewing. There's all these great techniques. When you're traumatized, cognition is turned off. So you cannot use talk therapy when people are in a highly stressed or traumatized state. It doesn't work. Then you can use medication and any kind of medication, what it will do, it will lower the arousal and the symptoms. Once the medication is gone, the reason it came is still there. So it hasn't resolved it, but it has solved it temporarily. When you work with the nervous system in this way, you're not 
getting, it's kind of an exposure therapy, uh, but not in the way that you're getting used to it over time and training your nervous system to live with it. Instead, what you're doing is you're using sensory input, just like EMDR or many of the other therapies. You're using sensory input, in this case, touch, to create an electrochemical response that can be measured. It works on dogs, it works on horses, it has nothing to do with whatever you believe or anything. This is a neuros neuropsychology in application. So just having said that, so you get an idea. And I think the closest you would get is probably breathing techniques or uh, EMDR if you would compare it to something else. That's the kind of family it belongs to. Yeah, because our um, the skin is the, uh, one of the biggest organs in, in, uh, in the body. Um, and touch is um, vital for life. So babies who are not touched, they will not survive. Um, so being touched and being held is super important. And that's why we go to, you know, to hug somebody or somebody when you need support or feel uh, safe. So it's nothing strange at all. And many of the gestures that are in the techniques that we teach are things that people do um, anyway in, in, uh, in life. But these are put in, uh, into a systematic structure and, and they become much more efficient. So this um, TTT trauma tapping technique, it is um, derived from the original tapping technique that was created in, in, um, by a, a, a psychotherapist and psychologist in the US in the beginning of the 1980s. So it's not, it's not I mean, it's new, but it's not super new. I mean, 1980, it's already 40 years ago, um, but it's still considered um, in some places that are not uh, well known, but like in the US and in the UK and many other places, it has become part of um, what is um, um, offered to, to, to people to especially to use for themselves as self-medication or self-help um, um, while perhaps waiting for other kind of, of treatment. But then the bonus is that often it resolves actually um the 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 symptoms of of trauma and for our experience it is it is actually it heals symptoms of trauma and um uh, so this ttt is um considering uh, some tapping which in in english is this movement that you tap with your fingertips on some points and they are specific points and you see this other image are the points indicated that are used in most tapping techniques, because there are many different TLAs, three letter abbreviations. Um, and the most common one is called EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique. If any of you have heard of a tapping, then it probably is that one. What um, I was trained in from the beginning is called TFT, Thought Field Therapy. Um, and then this is one of the simpler versions and also not using words. And the reason being that if a person is traumatized, um, cognition is is kind of off, um, and also this that to relate your what you have been through is not always helpful. Um, so to be able to resolve things without telling the story, because sometimes when you have been through something very challenging and you keep repeating it, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and it takes more and more space of your life because it doesn't shrink always. For some people it does, but for many it becomes even bigger and more situations become can become traumatizing because you feel the same sensations that you did at the time of the event. Yeah, And that's why when we do this, um, we keep it without words and just do the actual um, tapping. <laughs> oh, so this is um, TTT. You start by um, breathing. Uh, so you can have some um, deep breathing. An easy way is to lift your shoulders and roll them back. And that is, you know, you can do that a couple of times just to open up the breathing and relax a bit the chest that becomes tense when we do, um, when we are stressed. 
So breathing is, of course, the basis of all um, relaxation. And when you are in this um, position, you can just sit, you know, straight. So you have your spine comfortably erect. You have your feet in the in the floor. So you are your base. I mean, you have your roots, which are your feet. And then you can also connect to something that stresses you. And now when you're trying, you don't have to do it. Um, take something big, just something slightly that when you think of it, you get some kind of emotional reaction because you need to connect to this. Um, slight something. And then um, you just do this tapping. So you start on the side of the hand. So you tap, I'll take off this one. It's cold in Sweden, it's winter. So, but here, so you tap on the side of the hand, um, like this part that you would use for chopping bricks if you are a karate maestro. And you tap with two or three fingers and you do like 12 to 15 times. And when you have done this, you go up here. So you put your thumbs on your temples and you make like a massage of your forehead. Some four or five times, okay? And then you tap just where your eyebrows meet. So it's like here, you tap just above the nose and then you go to the outside of your eyes. So this is another point. So all these are specific points that are connecting into your nervous system, sending signals of peace, which is very much needed in these days. It's a peace message to your brain. And as we know, the more peace people have within, the more peace we can create in the world. That's why also our aim of this work that we do is to contribute to more peace within and in the world. And then with one hand, you go under the nose. So that's the next point between the nose and the lip. And then under the mouth. And then on the chest, so you tap all over the chest. And then you take one hand and put it on the opposite shoulder and you tap on the side of your body. It's on the ribs, so it becomes like 90 degrees with this arm over and then here on the ribs, okay? And then you go to the fingers. So you start with your little finger and it's just beside the nail. You tap and then you go to the next finger. Good. And then finally the thumb, it's also here like this. Okay, and then we do once again on the chest. Good, and then you release your arms and then you breathe again. So you breathe in with your nose, hold your breath for a while and then breathe out. And then again, you breathe in Hold your breath and then breathe out. And then you do the same things, but on the other side, if you remember where you started, otherwise you just do it once more. So you can do it on the other hand, still with this 10 to 15 times um, on each side. And then from here, you do this Massage so that you activate a bit, you know, you get some more stimulation, some more circulation in this part of the brain that goes offline when you're stressed, where you have your executive functions and your logic thinking, which goes off when we are stressed. You know, we don't become very, very intelligent when we are stressed because we start doing th things very reactive, which is not um, in that 
sense that you decide what you do, you start reacting. And then outside the eyes again, and under the eyes, and under the nose, and under the mouth, and over the chest. And then one hand on the opposite shoulder, and then here on the side. Very good. And then go for the fingers. And then the thumb. And then finally, again on the chest. So we do the chest twice in each round because it has so many points that are vital when it comes to sending these signals through the nervous system to calm down and also has points that helps the immune system to be activated behind this breastbone. You have your thymus gland that is very vital in your immune system. As you know, the immune system will go also offline when we are traumatized and stressed. That's why we get easily sick because the brain and the body thinks that that's not necessary now because we are stressed and we need to get away from this dangerous situation. Okay, and then you release your hands and then you breathe in. Hold your breath and breathe out. And again, you breathe in. Hold your breath and breathe out. And then you can just sit with your eyes closed for a little while after we're finished and then you you reflect on how it feels in your body. Good. So that's TTT, trauma tapping technique. Hmm? Should go? And so now that you're reflected on it and you felt it, that, that's basically it. And this is something that you can do on a daily basis just to see how you're doing, just to feel what's going on with you. And to give you some ideas about um, just a really, really fast run through on, on what this might help you with, if you want to know what different ways trauma can express itself. So uh, when somebody is traumatized, what you will find is that the symptoms appear in different channels of our human being. So one of these channels is the cognitive channel. When somebody is stressed or traumatized, we have conscious and subconscious thoughts, and we might find it starting to get difficult to think about ourselves, to mentalize things, to process it cognitively, because we are reactive. And the reactiveness is what the post-traumatic stress is. It, it, actually, it's, it's neurochemicals. When, when something, a stimuli of some sort, makes us react and go into fight and flight or defense or raises our stress level, maybe not to that height. It means we're getting neurochemicals that allow us to not think. It kind of hinders us in thinking because we're supposed to react much faster than the cognition actually does. So if we have this for a long while, then we basically get effects in how we think. We start thinking in different ways. We start finding it hard to access certain thought patterns and things. And maybe thoughts are intruding on us. Uh, of uh, triggered by situations. The autonomous nervous system starts reacting uh, automatically. So we start acting out. We have what might be called defensive rage. We lash out to people. We're irritated. We get cravings. We look for sugar. We look for something. We start playing Candy Crush 24 seven or, or Tetris or whatever to keep our mind off the automatic thoughts that are happening. We might be closing down. We might be getting phobias. We might be getting heartbeat. And on, after a long time, what happens to the body is we get effects because fight and flight is intended to be a short term reaction to put us into safety. That's why we first try to flee. If we can't, first we freeze. After freezing, we, we check, should we fight or should we flee? After the flight is the preferred mode. If we can't flee, we have to stand and fight. If none of these work, we go into panic. And panic is kind of different from, from fighting. Um, 
And then if that doesn't work, we shut down, we go into hypoarousal, which means it's like a, a frozen state where we might be there, but we're apathetic. We can't really react to stuff. But the body actually turns off certain functions during this time. So after, if we go in this tension for a long while, we start experiencing stiffness, pain, headaches, digestion issues, because the bowels are affected immediately. We get constipated, we get diarrhea. Um, our immune system goes down because it's turned off. We start getting uh, fungus infections and, we, and, and all kinds of different things. We start getting colds more often. And those are the somatization uh, issues. Then we have emotional reactions to an event. We might start shutting down what we feel in our body because it's uncomfortable. So we might f start finding it difficult to access feelings. We get more and more logical, more in our head, or we have a hard time attaching to people. We start avoiding uh, places and spaces and social situations because it's too much to handle. Now, all these things, all of these symptoms can be reversed. I'm not saying that we can resolve them. We never promise anything. We say, if you try, for example, doing this trauma tapping on a daily basis, just like you wash your hands and brush your teeth on a daily basis, you do this, for example, every night before you go to bed, then what will happen is you're actually lowering your arousal so that you go to sleep with a lower arousal. It's been measured to lower cortisol levels, for example, adrenaline and these hormones of stress which means you'll have a better sleep. And with a better sleep, you have a better um, resilience the day after. If you wake up at night with a nightmare, or if something triggers you, a noise, a sudden action, a smell, or even during the day, if you do this when it happens, it will do what is called a depotentiation process. It, it will resolve some of those reactions because if you lower arousal immediately in a 10 minute window after it has happened what actually will happen is the nervous system will recalibrate the importance of that arousal so walk into the street you hear a truck coming last time you walked in the street and heard a truck you were hit by a truck so the noise of the truck triggers you more than a scooter or electric car or something else so you're getting this reaction and then you're back at home, you're in the kitchen, you hear a truck passing the window, you get the reaction even though you're not in the street. So this is how it works. So if you then do the tapping, just follow it in the app or follow from this movie, what you're actually doing is you're telling your nervous system, yes, there was a truck, but we don't need to react this much. And if you manage to lower your arousal, which tapping will do or any other way that you can find, then the nervous system will say the next time there's a truck, maybe we don't have to react that much. So this is how your reactiveness goes down. Good. Can you, can you turn on metal or else can we talk about them? Yeah, no? so number 12. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, so the reason for us to, you know, to, to share these techniques that we said um, before is this that um, we have found them so helpful in all these different uh, situations um, that um, we have been in. And also this that, like yourself, you can add it on into whatever you're doing. So, um, and the reason being this, that these tapping techniques have a lot of, um, what you say, um, positive, um, um, reason, what you say, um, functions, you could say. You can probably get one there. Um, so it is very efficient. I mean, this this technique. Um, it is goes fast to 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 do it. I mean, we did it now. It takes like five minutes to do it. So you don't have to engage into um, a long session, but you can start any meeting you have. For example, if you're out working in a challenging situation, you can like a poor Um, if you're working in a challenging situation, you can um. When you have a meeting, a morning meeting, or you're deciding what to do uh, for where where you are, um, you can start a meeting by doing this technique. So it doesn't, it's not needed that you are in, you know, um, this is a treatment, but this is something that you do to make people be in the present situation, because the more stressful situation, the more uh, risk that people are a bit absent-minded because you're still thinking of different things you've been through and what will happen and you're worried and you have you know this experience and what will happen today and the reason for taking this photo was I mean it's also from um, the refugee camp that we worked for many years in in Greece and in Moria 
where one of these big tents where refugees were staying was just suddenly on fire. Um, and then, of course, this affects everybody, um, the refugees, as well as those working there. And it doesn't cost anything to do this technique and because it is all there. It's in your fingertips and it has no side effects like medication can work very well. Like we said before, it is will lower the arousal, but it will give some side effects and then it doesn't really resolve what was the reason for you to go into this high level of stress. And it's available all the time. So these are the, the kind of uh, techniques that we keep um, sharing. And then, and, mm-hmm. and, and also then there, that are, it is. there are 150, over yeah. 150 studies in peer reviewed journals. So there's, there's plenty of good science on this. And then there's one specific um, uh, article that might interest you uh, from one of our colleagues. His name is Dr. David Feinstein, who has written one specific article um, about using these kind of techniques in catast- after catastrophic events um, and in humanitarian aid. So um, um, this is our the basis for our our work and the reason for choosing to share these uh, specific ways of dealing with high arousal and see to yeah. that because the more you can see to keeping that daily emotional hygiene, the less risk it is to be traumatized. <laughs> And so for those of you who are, are interested in um, various explanation models for this, uh, there are many explanation models for it. Um, we say we say there are signs. You can look into the science. It's on our site. There, on our website, you have a, a tab called Research. There you can find a summary of recent research, uh, the most important articles, the one of David Feinstein showing use after catastrophic events and how that works, why it has been proven well for PTSD, for example. Uh, but in... The, in these multiple explanation models, one is that it is something called amygdala depotentiation. So depotentiation theory means that uh, when something happens to you that is traumatizing, it is because it is inescapable. Because it was inescapable, your nervous system will store all stimuli around you at the time when it happened so that it can warn you for this happening in the future. So for example, like the truck, like we said. Now the nervous system doesn't only store what happened just when the issue took place. It also actually for many people stores what happened just before. So if you were having a friendly chat with with a friend on the phone and you were having a really good time and and hearing a beautiful song in your headphones, that can also trigger traumatic reactions in the future because your nervous system wants to stay one step ahead. Also with when it comes to trauma, a good thing to understand is that a incident that may seem traumatic doesn't have to be that. Four people go into a room, something happens. You go out of the room, only one person might develop post-traumatic stress. And for the other person, it might not happen then. It might not happen in 10 years or 15 or 20 years. But 20 years later, now this is what we call a half trauma in this, just bear with me with a metaphor. And 20 years later, another half of the same situation happens. Now your nervous system will say, hey, wait a minute. This was almost traumatic 20 years ago, and now it's almost traumatic again. That adds up to a full traumatic uh, incident. So there's no way of saying that I, you know, I don't remember having had a traumatic reaction to this before, but now it's important. And for many people, including humanitarian aid workers, it happens when you get children. Because when you see your children growing up, you will go through everything that is dangerous in your mind that you need to protect them from. So for many people, you might be working humanitarian. It's okay. You're in difficult situations. You see children that have fair, that have had a bad situation and you're helping them, but you can keep a distance to your private self. Then one child turns up that wears the same necklace as your daughter or son. All of a sudden, this goes under the radar and goes into, oops, this could happen to my family. And that's when your amygdala can be potentiated for something that might not seem to be so big because trauma is personal. It has nothing to do with necessarily big events or violence. It could be the sum of things. So one thing is amygdala depotentiation. Then we have something called memory reconsolidation theory, which basically means you have a memory. When you bring it up, it makes you react. If you can lower arousal, the memory is restored with a lower arousal, which basically makes a lot of sense. All these things are uh, hypotheses. A lot of them have 
loads of science, but it doesn't mean that these are the only mechanisms. We're only trying to explain it so that you get an idea what it is that happens. Another thing um, that means why this is working is because when we engage the full brain, because half of the brain usually shuts down when we're in a traumatic reaction, most of all speech center and cognition, and we go into the right brain half, which is more um, more of a instinctive reaction of the experiential brain. Now, this is not this is not as simple as I'm saying. It's more complex. But if we use it as a metaphorical model, we can understand that when we're traumatized, we're out of sync. Part of our brain shuts down because more primitive parts are there to try to save us. If we can reactivate the more sophisticated parts and get more of the brain online, we move out of this traumatized space. Okay, so lowering arousal and getting back. So anything that is a bihemispherical stimulation, which is an explanation to why eye movements or butterfly hug, which is a version of that, can work. So getting back in rhythm, getting back into both sides, all sides of your body, the opposite of dissociating. Yeah, there was this question about um, um, why not using words? And one reason, I mean, like when we do this tapping, we don't need to use words. I mean, if somebody wants to tell what it is, but you need to connect to what it is that you want to resolve. Um, so that is um, the whole point of this, but that is only uh, necessary to do internally. So it's an internal exposure uh, to what it is. And very slightly, you don't have to go deep into any kind of event or emotion. It's just to touch it, uh, you know, touch it, but with your um, emotional reaction and there is a reason there is a strong reason being that um, you can be re-traumatized uh, from telling about an event and that is not necessary so we have a mentor Dr. Carl Johnson who was uh, who is a professor of psychology who um, I traveled with to Rwanda that's how this work started I mean learning from a trauma expert and one of the things he said, and we keep following what many of the things this wise person said, is that people who are traumatized have, have suffered already. It's not necessary to suffer again, rather the opposite, to use this technique to lower the suffering. And so that's one of the reasons. But then also because we work in many different uh, environments, like Anne-Sophie is... Um, is writing this that you can work with different people from different nationalities um, with very small explanation or just showing this is how you do the tapping. So you can actually show it in any, and to big groups, you can just say, just follow me, you know, you do these gestures and people can resolve. Also, there is one more, several reasons. And that is because for many people, some of the uh, things that are have given traumatic reactions is connected to shame. And that can be also when you are a humanitarian worker, coming back to what we said in the beginning, that you have chosen a work and then you feel, I cannot manage. I start, I'm feeling fear or I want to just go sleeping or hide myself. And then you can actually resolve that because the fear comes from experiences that you have had in the field and then you can resolve it. Also, if you work with people who have experienced things, for example, sexual abuse, which is in most parts of the world, very much connected to shame. You don't have to tell anybody what you are dealing with, but still you can heal, you know? Because for some, they never heal because they feel that I don't want to reveal this to anybody, what I, what I have experienced. But then with this, you can actually because you don't have to, to tell anybody, um, which we find is so, and so many people find it, oh, oh, oh I don't have to tell. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the reason. Yes, yeah, so we're and, getting close to, to, to the well, end of this presentation, yeah. So I'd like to add to that, that uh, I mean, what, what we advocate is instead of speaking or concentrating on speaking, instead of giving advice, instead of trying to be compassionate, which isn't always helpful, because anything you say could trigger the other person. Being empathetic sounds like a good idea, but empathy can actually unintentionally trigger a, a sad response or, or a traumatic response from a person. You have no idea because trauma is personal. So we recommend a safe, efficient, and playful approach, which is clean, 
And clean comes from clean language by psychologist David Grove, who worked with trauma 25 years. But the basis of a clean approach is assume nothing. If a person comes and says, I have been violated, that does not mean that they do not want to be touched. All you do is say, okay, can I help you with this or do you want to do it for yourself and watch me when I'm doing it? That's how it works. We never assume anything because the actual assumption can trigger things with people. So we ask, we assume nothing. We don't add, we don't evaluate. Somebody says, I've had a terrible experience. I was actually tortured. Then we don't say, oh, I'm so sorry for you because they didn't ask for sympathy. Uh, and, and getting sympathy might be a trigger. So staying clean and neutral, just, okay, you were tortured. May I show you a way if that bothers you now that you might lower your arousal? This is what I can offer you. I'm sorry, I, I, th this is what I have. If you wanna try it, you know, it's there. We say offer, don't insist. And one way of keeping it safe when you are with a traumatized colleague or person is by what clean means, don't add empathy, sympathy, your opinions, your projections, and don't add your words because you have no idea what word could trigger a person. So if somebody says, I had a terrible experience, the word you will use to reflect to them that you've understood them is terrible terrible experience. And they will say, yes, you understood me. But if you say I had a bad, oh, you mean it was, you mean it was awful? Then you're trying to discuss things and, and it's about you understanding or not. This is irrelevant. All you have to do is say terrible and nod and do, would you like to try this technique? And that is actually enough. And then we ask for no details. That's another thing. Like Gunilla said, you know, there, there's so much shame. It could be abuse. It could be sexual. It could be feeling inadequate. It could be, I made it, but my friend got hit or killed or left behind. All these things, survivor shame, all these things rolled into one. We don't bother about it. It's first aid. Just doing the technique and following these simple, simple rules, not assuming, not adding, not evaluating. If we talk the same words and ask no details, then we have a pretty safe way of applying this as an emotional first aid and emotional hygiene. Yeah. Yeah. So our, you know, takeaway is just try it, you know, try this technique and um, watch the videos um, and see what it does for you and then share it with others. Because for us, it is find calm and pass it on. That is our motto. I mean, find calm and pass it on. And you can try to find calm through these techniques and then um, let us know. <laughs> yeah, so that is, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, thank Gunilla and Half. It was really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a million. Um, now we are arriving at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, I would like to thank you again for, for being here. Um, we're going to have a 10-minute